Finally, after all those principles of flight, we're gonna look at how the four main forces affect us when we're actually traveling through the air. The weight is over. Trust me when I say that nothing will be lift out of this class. And there's drag as well. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to class 14 in the Principles of Flight series. Today we're going to take a step back and look at the aircraft as a whole. We already know that the aircraft can generate lift, that it creates drag, and that we can manoeuvre it using the controls. But in this class we're going to be looking at how the weight, thrust, drag and lift all act in harmony to achieve specific manoeuvres. I'm going to break this class down into two parts. And in this first part we're going to be looking at level flight and climbing. In level flight, the four forces are perfectly balanced if we're assuming the aircraft is not accelerating. Lift is equal to weight and thrust is equal to drag. This is our starting point for all things when we're talking about flight physics. Lift acts through the centre of pressure, as we know, and the weight acts through the centre of gravity. Drag acts partly through the centre of pressure, that induced drag portion, and the parasite drag acts over the whole aircraft. And if we take the average position, it may be above or below the centre of pressure, but for simplicity, we just assume that drag acts through the centre of pressure. Thrust acts through the centre of the engine. We also have the turning moment, which is caused by the lift weight couple. This is counteracted by downforce produced at the tail. This downforce is effectively added to our weight and that is what has to be overcome by the lift. So lift is equal to weight plus the downforce. Another turning moment is usually formed by the engines and the drag. Drag acts straight back from the centre of pressure and thrust acts through the centre of the engines. If the engines and the centre of pressure were perfectly aligned, on the perfect same horizontal line there would be no turning moment. But if the engines are mounted either above or below, you get a turning moment. In under wing engines, for example, the moment will oppose this moment that is caused from the lift and weight couple. So you would get a nose up rotation. And that means that we don't need as much downforce from the tail. Think of level flight as that neutral point and all other manoeuvres are just edits of this. Before we start looking at the forces in a climb, there's a few definitions to get out of the way first, mainly pitch, flight path angle and angle of attack. So the flight path angle is the angle between the horizontal line and the actual path that the aircraft is moving through the air. That would be this angle in here and it's often given the symbol gamma. It is different from the aircraft pitch, which is the angle between the horizontal and the longitudinal axis of the aircraft. That would be this big angle in here. The reason for this difference is because aircraft have to fly at an angle to the air in order to produce lift. That angle we know and we call it the angle of attack. So that would be the angle of attack in there. So our direction of travel, our flight path angle, is also the direction of relative airflow that we use for calculating our angle of attack. So on a diagram we can see that the pitch of an aircraft, the angle between the longitudinal and the horizontal, is a combination of the flight path angle plus the angle of attack. When climbing, depending on the steepness of the climb, that flight path angle, different proportions of the weight act against the thrust and lift of the aircraft. An easy way to think of it is if we had a flight path angle of 90 degrees going straight up, then the aircraft weight is in direct opposition to the thrust. This is because the weight always acts straight down. Obviously we don't climb straight up unless we're in something like a Harrier jump jet. So that means that our weight only partly opposes the thrust and partly adds to the drag. That's what we see in this diagram over here. The amount of weight that acts either against the lift or the thrust is based on the sine and the cosine of the flight path angle. You can see here that this angle, or gamma, is the same as this angle here due to just basic geometry. So if we take the sine of the angle and multiply it by the weight, we come up for a value for this. This would be weight sine gamma. 
That is the amount of weight that acts down the slope opposing the thrust. And the long line here would be the weight times the cosine of the gamma, the weight that acts into the slope. For the climb to be steady, all forces must be balanced. So our lift is equal to our weight times the cosine gamma, and our thrust is equal to the drag plus this portion of weight that is pulling us down the slope, so W sine gamma. This means that in a climb, our lift is actually less than our weight, which seems a bit weird, but it's basically because some of that weight is now being taken over by the thrust. The thrust now has responsibility for some of that weight, and only a portion of it is under the responsibility of the lift. Because that thrust now has to take on a responsibility for some of the weight, it means that the thrust is actually larger than the drag in a climb as well. The angle for our best climb is dependent on the amount of excess thrust we have available. If you think about it, the thrust has to take control of the drag and also that portion, which is W sine gamma. If we can easily overcome the drag and the weight, then our value for sine gamma can go up and up and up, and that means that the angle can increase and increase and increase. If we rearrange the formula, we can see this a bit more easily. So we've got our angle is equal to the thrust minus the drag over the weight. If we maximize the thrust and reduce our drag and reduce our weight, that means that our value for sine gamma can go up as much as possible. And that means that our angle of climb can go up as much as possible. So the, where these factors are all optimized is where our amount of available thrust exceeds the amount of required thrust that we have. So our amount of required thrust is simply the amount of thrust we need to overcome the total drag of the aircraft. So we essentially draw the total drag curve. The amount of available thrust we have is dependent on whether we're in a jet or propeller aircraft. A jet aircraft always has a steady amount of thrust available. A propeller does not and the line for propeller reduces as we go faster and faster. We'll see why when we talk about propellers in the future class. The greatest distance between the thrust we have available and the thrust required is where we have our best angle. So for a jet, it occurs at this point here, which is also our speed for minimum drag. The speed that we use to get our best angle is known as Vx. On a propeller, it is not going to occur at VMD. It's going to occur somewhere around the region of here, where our lines are the greatest distance apart. Obviously, this speed is below VMD and it can be very close to the stalling angle. So it has to be a very careful climb if you're climbing at Vx in a propeller. As altitude increases, the engines take in thinner air for the combustion and essentially the strength of the thrust decreases as a result. And that means that the lines for the propeller and the jet move down. This means that the difference between our available thrust and our thrust required reduces and therefore so does our actual angle for the best climb that we get, even though the speed remains the same. So climb angles and flight path angles are all very good, but they aren't really used in the real world. More commonly, gradients are used. This is what you see when you're out driving, for example. This is basically the vertical change over the horizontal change as a percentage. So for this example, a 5% gradient would be equal to going up five meters and going across 100 meters, for example. You're traveling 5% up for the full distance that you're going along horizontally. In the aviation industry, we use a bit of a, a bodge, as I would call it, or a workaround when we're talking about gradients because we make some assumptions that the distance we've flown, our angle of climb, and the horizontal distance and the vertical change are all intertwined. So in aviation, we travel vast distances um, along the Earth. So when compared to our vertical height change, the triangle of these distances is often very thin and narrow like this. This means that our flight path angle is very small 
and it also means that our hypotenuse and adjacent sides are roughly equal in length. If we just take a rough ballpark, got from the end of my pen to around this point here, and we take it down, you can see there's very little change between those two distances. So what we can do is we can essentially say that the sine of the angle, which is equal to our opposite over our hypotenuse, is the same as our tan or tangent of the angle, which is the opposite over the adjacent because the hypotenuse and the adjacent are basically the same size. Mathematicians going furious right now, but aviation is practical application. So you say sine gamma is equal to tan gamma. And then tan gamma is the same as our vertical change over our horizontal change. So we can say sine gamma equals tan gamma, which equals our gradient. Once we have all these things established, we can substitute them into our equation for our climb. So thrust equals the drag plus W sine gamma. And then if we rearrange it, we have sine gamma equal to thrust minus drag over the weight. And then sine gamma is essentially the same as the gradient. So our gradient is equal to thrust minus drag over weight. So this will give you an answer of like zero point something, 0 0.05 for this case. And you just have to remember that that is something that you multiply by 100 and you'll find the value of percentage. So these are quite common questions in the exams. So I've written a wee example here. A departure from London Gatwick requires a climb gradient of 3% for the departure. An aircraft produces 15,000 newtons of thrust and generates 7,500 newtons of drag. To achieve the required gradient, what is the maximum takeoff mass that we're allowed? So we basically write down the equation, plug in the numbers and come up with the answer. So we have our gradient equal to thrust minus drag over weight. I'm trying to find weight. 3% is 0 0.03 and that equals our thrust. Where are we? 15,000 minus the drag, 7,500 over our weight. Weight equals 7,500 divided by 0 0.03. Weight equals 250,000. That's in Newtons. So then we would divide by 9.81 or 10 to get the actual mass. So mass equals using 9.81, 25. 484.2 kgs. So in summary then, in level flight, we have the forces acting on the aircraft as shown, with thrust equal to drag and lift equal to the weight plus the downforce. The reason we need this downforce is because of this lift weight couple and the nose down moment that it causes. There can also be a moment form between the drag and the thrust, but is dependent on where the engines actually lie. The pitch of an aircraft is made up of the flight path angle plus the angle of attack. The flight path angle is the angle we actually move through the air and the angle between that airflow or the direction we're moving and our longitudinal axis is our angle of attack. Combine them together and you get the value for pitch. When climbing, different proportions of weight act down the slope as well as into the slope. And that means that we have to multiply by the cosine and the sine to find the values for these. And that then translates to our thrust having to take some of the responsibility for the weight. And the amount of responsibility it has to take is the weight multiplied by the sine gamma, the proportion that's acting down the slope. The lift therefore only has to take responsibility for part of the weight and that is the cosine gamma multiplied by that weight. Because thrust is having to take over more of that responsibility that means that thrust is actually now larger than the drag. Before they were equal but in a climb it has to be larger. That also means that because lift is taking up responsibility for a lesser proportion that the lift is now actually less than the total weight. 
Our best angle of climb is achieved at a speed known as Vx, which is the point where there is the biggest difference between our thrust required and our thrust available. The thrust available in a jet is always consistent, so to overcome our thrust that we require, our total drag, it is the point where the drag is the least, VMD. So in a jet, VMD equals VX. In a propeller, it's not the same because our thrust reduces as we go faster. So this point actually occurs at a lower speed than VMD, quite often quite close to the stall speed. So you've got to watch out while doing a VX climb. And then we've got this little bodge that we use, this little workaround. Um, because the angles are so small and our triangle is so long and thin, our hypotenuse and our adjacent are essentially equal. And that means that we can equate sine gamma to tan gamma, and tan gamma is the same as our gradient. It's the vertical over the horizontal, and that'll give us a 0, 0.0 something answer, multiply by 100 to get the percentage.